Welcome to r slash pro revenge, where underpaid employees stage a mass walk off and completely destroy the company. Our next Reddit post is from Large Meat Feast. I'm not sure if this is revenge or karma, so I hope it fits here. Back in the early 2000s, I worked for a tech company who offered tech support, on-site support, and training to organizations who either didn't want specialized IT staff or could benefit from outsourcing. The company consisted of three directors, a sales department, a finance and HR department, and a tech department. The tech department was further split up, with a senior manager, four team managers, and each team having two section managers. For call center support, where I worked, we had two team leaders, two senior engineers, two normal engineers, and two junior engineers. I was a standard engineer, earning 22 k for a job that was worth at least 5 k more outside of the low price area we all lived in. It was 2006 and I was still stuck in this same job, on the same pay. Conditions had become even worse, with no overtime, no flexi time, no financial compensation for industry qualifications, shortened breaks, and no pay raises since I started. To make matters worse, they sold part of the land that the office was on to a developer. And on-site car parking was now for management only. We had to either pay to use a nearby council car park or risk parking on the street. Morale was low, but despite the bad pay, it was still good for the area we lived in. One Friday in July, one of the senior engineers finds a document that he shares around the private chat app. It's a restructuring plan that the board voted on last week. Apparently, this document had to be made available to employees for three months before any changes to terms and conditions could be made. So, the board gave it a generic file name and tried to bury it in the large staff shared area of the network. One of the directors was selling his shares and moving on, having been headhunted by a large recruitment firm in a nearby city. The two remaining directors had managed to buy most of her shares with a small quantity going outside the company. This restructuring plan was the company's response. Most of the document was a typical downsize and restructure package with a twist. There were team mergers, staff reductions, and pay cuts to make it sound like they had to maximize profits to put the lost money back into the company. In October, a new contract would be released for everyone to sign, and it was generic. In November, the restructure would be announced, and by January 1st, a new structure would be in place. The director noted that the new contract had to include clauses for non-compete and soliciting customers because these didn't exist for the sales staff. The document also revealed what people's new salaries would be. My salary was going to fall by £5,000 a year, but the twist was that anyone with the word manager in their title would have their pay increase drastically. For example, the team manager's pay jumped from 52 k to 65 k By the end of the day, everyone under the rank of team leader had seen this document and we were not happy. Over the weekend, I got a text message from one of the senior engineers inviting me to a barbecue at his house. When I got there, most of the tech staff was already there and during that afternoon we formulated a battle plan. Our revenge. On Monday, 26 people in the tech team arrived for work as normal, each with a letter for the senior manager giving their one month notice. With each letter quoting the clause in their contract that states that employees who know confidential information about the company cannot continue working after they give their 30 days notice. No exceptions would be given. Specifically, the contract said that people who have turned in their notice could not continue working on the company grounds but they could work from home. And during that period we couldn't start a new job. The result of this was that at 9.30am, the director realized that his entire tech staff had quit. So he marched out to our cubicles and started harassing one of the senior engineers. The senior engineer simply stood, took off his ID badge and swipe card, handed them to the director and told him, I've already quit. This is just me following the contract. On cue, most of the staff followed, with one member staying until lunchtime. From what I've been told, directors, senior managers, and anyone they could get a hold of were on phones attempting to fix issues. The queue of unsolved tickets went from around 35 to nearly 100 by lunchtime. And naturally, the blame was left firmly at the door of those who quit. We were even bad-mouthed to customers. The day after our notice period expired, the senior engineer welcomed 25 new staff to his new company and had already taken 10 large contracts from the place we used to work for. We all had better pay and much better conditions with an actual career track rather than being at the whims of the managers. The old company tried to keep afloat for a year, but they were losing money on every contract and they couldn't afford to employ skilled or experienced people. They closed down in June of 2007 with the owners having to sell personal assets to pay debts. 
and the two remaining directors declaring personal bankruptcy too. I don't understand how the company managed to crash. They had all those high-paid managers, couldn't they do the jobs of all the workers? You know, honestly, it's surprising that more companies don't end up this way. When you just pour more and more money into management and less and less money into the people actually doing the work, how do these companies stay profitable? I guess in this specific case, they don't. Our next Reddit post is from Viper896. My dad was a mechanic for 20 plus years, and for long as I can remember, I drove him nuts because I would go around the house with the screwdriver he left out and take everything apart because I wanted to see how things worked. As I grew older, I developed an affinity towards computers and electronics, which led to me being that kid in high school who changed his grades, crashed the school district servers, and used the net send command with great success. I would spend my weekends either with my grandparents or uncle working on science projects or dragging my dad outside to help me fix my car. Those figure it out lessons were probably the greatest gift that he could have given me growing up. I joined the US Army in March of 2004 and went into communications, or COMO for short, where I managed to go from private when I joined to sergeant by the time I returned from my deployment at the beginning of 2007. After returning home, I was subsequently transferred from a light infantry unit, walking everywhere, to a mechanized infantry unit where we rode armored vehicles everywhere, and placed in charge of the battalion commo shop because the current person running the commo shop was scheduled to retire in a few months and I was the only other NCO. This is where things got interesting and my commo vs mechanics pro revenge story starts. As anyone else who's been in the army can attest to, every Monday is motor pool maintenance which essentially means to go make sure that all the tanks, Bradley fighting vehicles, or anything else with a motor works the way it should. This includes testing all the radio and communication equipment as well. If anything didn't work, we filled out the maintenance forms with the correct shop and had them fix it. All the issues would later be consolidated into a report that the leadership team would review. If a vehicle was on that report, the leadership team wanted to know why it wasn't fixed. I ran my shop using the same approach my dad taught me, which was to just figure it out and don't come to me with a problem unless you have a solution. One Monday morning shortly after I took charge of the commo shop, one of the soldiers came to me with a problem that he couldn't figure out and he asked if I could help him. I agreed and followed him over to the Bradley Fighting Vehicle, or BVF for short, that was giving him problems. After a few hours of troubleshooting, we finally traced the problem back to the BFV slip ring. We double and triple check that indeed that was a problem because 1. Slip rings in general have a low failure rate and 2. It wasn't something that we could fix on our own. It required help from the mechanics because the slip ring required taking apart the interior of the BFF turret to actually get to it. So I went to the mechanics to get their help so we could fix the problem. This is where I learned that the mechanics did not like the commo shop. I was essentially told by the motor chief to F off, and the slip ring is a commo issue and it's the commo shop shop to fix it, not theirs. I was pissed at their response and I tried to insist that we needed his help. However, I was promptly shut down and told to pound sand. At this point, I was beyond pissed. I tried the official way, I even swallowed my pride and asked him nicely, and both times I was dumped on. I decided I was going to play global thermonuclear war and teach him a lesson that neither he nor anyone else in his shop would soon forget. So I went to my guys and told them I would be back in an hour or two because I needed to run home and grab some stuff. When I got home, I went directly from my garage and started packing all the wrenches, impacts, and sockets that I could fit into my portable toolbox. I also loaded up the portable air compressor and any extension cords I could find and made my way back to the motor pool. Once I got back to the motor pool, I had my guys locate every extension cord they could find around the office because I could only find one in my garage and help me run power out to the BFF that we were going to have to fix ourselves. Meanwhile, I also had two of the guys run to the headquarters and find me two of the largest empty coffee cans they could find. I ended up having to tell them twice because the first time they thought I was joking. They couldn't understand why I needed a coffee can of all things. When they returned with the coffee cans, I had everything in place. I had power, compressed air, tools, and a place to neatly put all the bolts, nuts, and washers I was about to remove. Under normal circumstances, I would only remove the things that absolutely had to be removed. The fewer things to put back together, the better. But these weren't normal circumstances, and I had absolutely no intention of putting anything back together. It was about lunchtime, and I decided that my way of fixing this issue probably wasn't the best example to set for my team. So I sent them to lunch and told them I would handle this issue so they could focus on other vehicles when they got back. 
For the next few hours, I proceeded to dismantle every single bolt I could find. I removed seats, interior plates, shelves, pretty much anything that wasn't electrical or combo related got removed. I would then place all the newly removed hardware in the coffee can. By the time I reached the turret, I had filled up both coffee cans with nuts, bolts, and washers, so I had to find something else to start putting this stuff in. Luckily, we had Ziploc bags by the dozen laying around the office. I grabbed a couple of those and went back to having fun taking apart the BFV. I finally reached a slip ring and managed to luck out. I didn't have to replace the slip ring at all. It turns out the mechanics didn't install one of the cable mounts, and one of the combo cables got snagged and subsequently cut. It probably took me less than 15 minutes at that point to replace the cable in the missing cable mount. Of course, the fact that I completely removed everything in the way helped because now I didn't have to fish out the cable through anything. Once I replaced the cable and made sure all the other combo equipment worked, I figured while I had everything taken apart, it would be much easier to fix any other problems they might have been having. All combo systems checked out and my job was done. Everything that I'd taken out of the BFV was then gently and neatly stacked in the interior of the BFV. <laughs> I put the lids on the coffee can, zipped up the bags, pulled out my trusty sharpie and wrote bolts on each of them. Once everything was tidied up, I went off to find the owner of the BFV and let him know his combo issue had been fixed. But he should probably have a mechanic look at his BFV because I had to disassemble some, and by some I meant most of the vehicle, in order to get to the part that I needed to replace, and I couldn't remember how everything went back together. I stared out of my office window for the rest of the day, waiting for the mechanics to get around to looking at the BFV. I still remember the reaction of the motor chief when he looked inside the vehicle, and if I didn't know any better, I could have sworn his head rotated around three times and nearly popped off. His reaction was absolutely priceless. I knew he was about to storm into my shop in a fit of rage, so I got up and decided it was probably best to meet him outside in the motor pool. As soon as I reached earshot distance, he started screaming and demanding that I put the vehicle back the way I found it. However, I was having none of that. I simply shook my head and told him it was a mechanical issue now and it wasn't my job. I asked for your help in the beginning and I was told no because it wasn't your job. I'm just a combo guy. I didn't know what needed to be removed so I could fix the combo issue in the slip ring, so I removed everything. If someone from your team would have been there, I think this whole misunderstanding could have been avoided. That vehicle remained on the weekly report for the next three weeks while they figured out what bolts went where. However, after that incident, I was never told it's not my job ever again. And the mechanics were more than willing to help me fix any issues that came up. By the time I left the unit, we ended up starting to cross-train each other's team members so we could fix things faster as they came up. Down in the comments, DTT says, Genius. Freaking genius. How was your relationship with the Motor Chief after this occurred? OP replies, He was pissed for about a month, but he came around and we ended up working pretty well together. Wow, OP. That's incredible. Not only did you destroy your enemy, but you ended up turning him into your friend as well. Our next Reddit post is from Fallout Fan. Background. I lived with a group of people who I thought were my friends. They were two couples, and we all lived in the same house for almost two years until I recently moved out. There was David and Tina and Brittany and AJ. I was the only single person there. There was a debate on how we should pay the bills, but we all decided to give the money to the person whose name was on the bill. David paid the mortgage, Tina paid water, electric, and gas, and I paid the internet. It came to the point where I was paying close to 80% of the mortgage by myself. The entire water bill, about 75% of the gas and electric, and I was paying the internet bill by myself. I was still giving money to the person in charge of the bill, but I came to find out about 10 days before I moved out that the mortgage was defaulted and the house was in foreclosure. Also, the water, gas, and electric bills were in constant threat of being shut off, and the only up-to-date bill was the internet. While they all saw me struggle to pay these off, they were mindlessly spending money during the day which is when I sleep due to working third shift, so I never saw the mindless things they spent money on. Nor did I ever see the mail since they grabbed it before I woke up. Brittany never paid anything because she was having her check garnished due to unpaid student loans, but she always had expensive makeup. AJ never held a job for more than two weeks. David and Tina were always taking time off work, knowing that I would never allow them to go without a home due to our history. One day I woke up and went to go check the mails. I was expecting a package, and that's when I saw bills in the mail. So I decided to investigate. 
I opened up the gas and electric bills to see a total of almost $400 and it was at risk of being shut off. I was shocked and pissed. I knew right then and there what was going on and I vowed to screw them over as hard as I could. The revenge. I had just interviewed for a new job that paid almost double what I was making before. And I knew that I interviewed well with them, so I told myself that if I got the job, I would give my roommates a 30 day notice and move out. And since it was close to the end of the month and I'd already paid them, I'd be moving out before the 1st of February. I got the call with the job offer the next day, which I happily accepted. I did the paperwork for the background check and it all came back clean. The same day that I accepted the offer, I typed out a 30 day notice and recorded myself with my phone in my breast pocket handing it to them, explaining that I was moving out. I started hunting for a place close to my work, which I found within a week. I was asked several times to help them with next month's bills, to which I said no, because I was saving for my own place and they had plenty of time to come up with the money between the four of them. I told them I was done paying all the bills by myself on the meager pay rate of $11 per hour. There were a lot of scowls, passive aggressive behavior, and flat out attempts to steal my things and my food without permission. The day came when I finally went and got my U-Haul and had a few of my friends help me move. I was determined to get it all in one go, so I got the biggest one they had and we got everything packed up. I took everything that was mine, down to my pizza stone, which they loved, my expensive kitchen knives which they would use and never clean, and even my toilet paper that I brought three days ago. And even then, a few of my toilet rolls had gone missing. After moving everything, I sat down on my couch, looked around with my cat in my lap, and breathed a sigh of relief. I happened to be good friends with my previous neighbors, and I asked them to keep an eye out for anything out of the ordinary. Four days later, I find out that the gas, electric, and water have all been turned off. And they had to go to the neighbor's place to get buckets of water so they could bathe and manually flush their toilets. Now, both couples had dogs. So I decided that those dogs were in a dangerous situation because they had no water and no heat in the middle of winter. And probably no food because I was the one who had been buying dog food. So I called the local humane society and left an anonymous tip about the dogs and how I was worried about them. The next day, my neighbor Todd texted me telling me that the dogs were removed from the home and that my previous housemates were being charged with neglect. And because of the lack of utilities that these were not civil but criminal charges. That was enough to make me smile, but I wanted more. I knew that David was divorced and had a child. I also knew that he wasn't paying child support. I then contacted the local courts and made them aware of the flagrant non-support and that maybe they could help the agency look for him. So I provided them with David's address. From there, we learned that he was almost $25,000 behind, which is a felony in the state where I live. David is now couch surfing because Tina left him. His house is foreclosed on and he has nothing in his name while facing multiple criminal charges. Moral of the story, don't take advantage of a friend who knows all your dirty little secrets. That was r slash pro revenge and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.